Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I am Kira Epstein, the co director at the New School at Commonweal. And today's conversation is the next in our series of co presented conversations with the Collaborative for Health and Environment, or CHE. It's a pleasure to work with the CHE team to present co-present some of their CHE Cafe conversations, including today's conversation with Justin Noble, Larissa Durska, and James Brew about oil field radioactivity. I will turn this over to CHE Director Kristen Schaefer to introduce herself and her guests in a minute. But for those of you who haven't been with us before, the New School at Commonweal is a learning community of dialogue and conversation that explores how to build more resilience and better stewardship for body, soul, community, and the earth. We produce our conversations and make them available for thousands of listeners worldwide on YouTube, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. We've been doing this since 2007, and we have more than 300 podcasts available on our media sites uh, including several other conversations in this environmental health series co-presented with Che. I'll turn it now over to Kristen, the Director of Commonweal's Collaborative for Health and Environment. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you so much, Kira, and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for this important conversation. Thanks also to our co-hosts of today's event, both at the New School and also the Science and Environmental Health Network. My name is Kristen Schaefer, and as Kira noted, I'm the director of the Collaborative for Health and Environment, or CHE. I'd like to say just a few words about CHE before I introduce our topic and speakers. For the past 22 years now, CHE has been supporting and amplifying environmental health science, organizing strategic conversations around key emerging issues in the field, and working to translate research in ways that support environmental health and justice. I invite you to visit our website at healthandenvironment.org to find out more about our work. So quite a bit of our work here at CHE focuses on the crisis of chemical contamination, the health impacts of these exposures, and what can be done to protect workers, families, and communities from toxic chemicals. We've also done some work to highlight the public health impacts of our changing climate. And we're very aware that these two accelerating crises are interlinked in many ways. So today's conversation is at the intersection of our climate crisis and human health in a different and very specific way. For the last seven years, science journalist Justin Noble has been investigating and documenting the health and environmental impacts of radioactive waste that's created by unconventional oil and gas production or fracking. I've had the opportunity to read through a preview copy of his upcoming book and the stories he's uncovered of dangerous exposures across oil country among workers, their families and communities are stories that urgently need to be told. This is an issue that it's, has been largely invisible. And as Justin finds through his reporting and research, this is not by accident. We're very grateful to have Justin here with us today to share some of his findings. And we'll also hear directly from James Brew, who is working to protect his own community from these exposures and has also experienced working in the industry, and Dr. Larissa Durska, a medical expert who will share some of the science on the health risks associated with exposure to this radioactive waste. We'll start with remarks and a, and a reading from Justin, followed by some thoughts from James and a brief discussion, and we'll then have a short presentation from Dr. Durska and then after a brief panel discussion, we'll open up for your questions. So now I'll properly introduce our first speaker. Justin Noble is a science journalist who writes for U.S. magazines, literary journals, and investigative sites. His investigation into the radioactivity brought to the surface in oil and gas production was first published in 2020 by Rolling Stone magazine, and that piece was awarded the best long-form narrative by the National Association of Science Writers. Justin's book on the topic, which is Petroleum 238, Big Oil's Dangerous Secret and the Grassroots Fight to Stop It, will be published next month. Justin, thank you so very much for joining us today, and I'll hand it over to you to get us started. 
Thank you, Kristen. And thank you so much to all the groups for helping to organize. Thank you for attending. Uh, it's really an honor to give this presentation uh, and, and also to, to give a really an intimate part of the book and together with um, one of the people that I met, one of the many people I met throughout my reporting process. Um, and I'll just give a, a really little backstory to how I got here as a journalist and how I was led to James. I think um, there's two parts of this reporting for me. There has been a, a very academic part, digging through past industry documents, academic reports, following the trail of science back through time, which is a really wonderful thing because science is this record that goes back through time and you learn to decode it and, and, and you learn that way. And then there's experience out in the world, in communities, in places where oil and gas development is happening, speaking to people in those communities, scientists in those communities, workers in those communities, and, and really learning what it's like to live through some of this. And um, while the book focuses on the issue of the radioactivity brought to the surface in oil and gas development, this has really been a way to look at many aspects of the industry. And, and you really start to peel apart the layers of the industry by honing in on this one issue. Um, and uh, yeah, to me, this is this is a really special opportunity. It's a little bit different than the webinars that are um, with slideshows and PowerPoints that I typically give. I'm just gonna go right in into a part of the book, which is coming out later in April. Um, and, um, and this is, a section in North Dakota, in Western North Dakota, uh, Fort Berthold, Fort Berthold Indian Reservation, uh, a really special part of the state of North Dakota, uh, and um, and we're going to meet James. And I'll begin. Uh, James steps out the door at the back of the living room and onto the porch. It is frigid, with the temperature now near 12 degrees Fahrenheit. And as black night falls across the reservation, a strange bobbing glow emerges on the horizon, like an orange egg of light bouncing up and down, contracting then expanding, at times shooting out a ripple of fire. He points to a second, a third, and a fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh. My brain wants to make something mystical and beautiful out of these colorful nighttime mirages, but they are just flares from all the natural gas being burned off wells across this part of the Bakken. The joke is this place was going to look like Mordor in five years, says James, or an H.G. Wells time machine, where they, when they fast forward to the deep future and there's just these machines crawling on top of the earth. That is what this industry reminds me of because they are invasive and they have taken all of the farmland, all of the land and transformed it into an industrial zone. And to see the lack of oversight that has accompanied this rush to explore to exploit a natural resource has been so painful. From any window in my house, I look out and see a flare. Sadly, the windows that get the most light are also facing the direction of the nearest well pad. We have blackout curtains for all of the windows because the light from the well and the flares is so unnatural. The flares block out the stars, they shake the house, when I see my moonlight out my window, it's nostalgic. It's like, where have you been? It's an eerie feeling, and you can't help but wonder, what am I breathing in? There is an orange glow, and I know that is from the lights of the flares getting trapped under the clouds, and I wonder what else is getting trapped underneath those clouds. James continues, I have to tell you, there was one night when that flare was shaking the house. We had blankets over the windows, we had the TV on, we had fans to block out the noise, and this was three o'clock in the morning. I looked at Victoria and I saw tears in her eyes and I just ran out the door. I found one of the security guys and I didn't tell him they had brought the woman I loved to tears in the middle of the night, but I laid into him. I said, you're making us crazy. If there is one moment I could implant in the head of someone who knows nothing about any of this, it would be that moment. In 2016, the road that ran by James's house and was used regularly by oil field trucks was taken out of use. This was done because Marathon Oil had begun clearing land for a new frack pad, and an access road for this pad would now be taking the truck traffic. James and his family already had a frack pad about 650 yards from their home. The new one would be even closer. 
Initially, it was to have five wells. Before that pad went in, it was the highest point in the area, says James, and it was a beautiful field. You could go up on that ridge 200 yards behind my house and see every point in every direction. When the farmer wasn't farming it, my kids would get off the school bus and I would pick them up and we'd drive through that field and across these little dips. When you hit them just hard enough, you'd get that butterfly feeling. So we called that Butterfly Hill. It was a place to sit back and be alone and get away. I remember walking through those fields one day and I had my hand in the farmer's wheat and I was thinking, I better soak this in because I probably always won't be able to do this. And of course, now I can't. I lost my butterfly hill. I lost my thinking spot. I lost my peace of mind. I lost a lot. One day there was a storm that came in and living where I do, you can sometimes appreciate a good storm because it is clouds rolling in and seeing the lightning and hearing the thunder. Those are natural sounds. I don't mind hearing those. They are natural vibrations, not noise from a set of generators going all night or trucks hitting their engine brakes. I was on my back porch and looking at these clouds and I saw this huge cloud of dust and I was thinking, what is that? This greasy, heavy, dirty smell. Then I realized I know what this is. A big rush of wind came in. It literally picked up everything from the well pad and it blew it over here and I could taste it. I felt like I was actually at the well pad because I could taste the stench of the guys working there. For a brief time in 2015, James tells me I worked in the industry. The boom had been going on long enough by that period. I suppose the reason in me mentioning this is because they are here on our land extracting our resources and the way they are doing it is very complicated and dangerous and we have entrusted them with that with our land our environment our lives and there is no decorum no honor no respect and because it is complicated you think at least they would be on it they would be safe but no they are completely reckless i was on a drilling rig and I remember looking off the drilling full floor looking off into the hills and i was watching these guys piss around the corner of the floor, watching the driller smoke cigarettes when the floor is covered in diesel, watching it all. And I was thinking, these guys are crude and they are everywhere and they're pissing in my backyard. Even though it is our land, it is their industry. Um, And just one thought I want to leave you all with is, uh, and this is something I learned in reporting on this topic, the first line of investigative journalism, the first line of of public health uh, investigations are the people in communities. Um, They are experiencing things. And to me, you know, the questions, some of the questions James is asking there, they're the beginning of my line of work, but I think of also really important public health questions, you know, talking about how the wind plays with these emissions, what gets trapped under clouds, uh, and how things move through the environment. um, And um, I'll pass it on now. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Justin. And yeah, congratulations on this, this work that you've done. And and I just want to say, I so appreciate your commitment to putting the affected people at the heart of your storytelling um, and using that as a way to, to raise these issues. Um, And so thank you for that. I now want to introduce James Brew, who you all already met in Justin's reading. Um, James is a writer, husband husband and father, and a tribal member of the Fort Berthold Indian Reservation in Western North Dakota. He lives in the community of Four Bears and has advocated tirelessly for the protection of his family, the environment, and his community from the harms of oil and gas development. James, thank you so very much for being with us today. I'll hand it off to you to share some of your experience with the oil industry in your community and, and the issue of radioactive waste. Welcome. <clears throat> thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you to the organizers of this event and uh, <clears throat> taking the time to do this. Um, Justin as well. Again, uh, I forgive me, it's an uh, emotional topic um, here in Justin. We read that. Um, a lot of this was years ago, um, but, uh, it's, it's very, <clears throat> very poignant. And in the chat, we have, uh, Joletta Birdbear, member of power, um, for Berthold, an organization here that does a lot of important work. Um, I don't want to seem like I'm the only person at Fort Berthold who cares, but, um, being that we're on 
sovereign land and that we're uh, an indigenous nation. There are some um, major differences in how our people are able to approach the issue of oil and gas development. Um, and um, I feel like a big part of how our people could benefit, not just from the, quote, economic side of oil and gas development, but um, our people could really benefit from being properly educated about the risks associated with oil and gas, not just what they want us to think is going to do us the best as far as money goes. But um, uh, the... Excuse me, I, I was trying to figure out how to approach this, but um, in 2000, 2020, I, Marathon was going to come back um, for a second round of drilling behind our house, and my wife, Victoria, um, was pregnant. And we went through literal, excuse me for saying hell, the first time. Uh, the second time around, I was able to get Marathon to put up a wall uh, around the well site. I don't understand why they didn't put these walls up before. Uh, I don't understand why they didn't do it around every well site for every family that was being affected. Um, I really had to cut my teeth uh, in the worst way possible, trying to get them to see things for what they were to try to mitigate risks to my family. And it was just, uh, it was really hard. And I, I don't want to sit here and um, lose my train of thought. I, I, I'm thankful that Justin was able to so eloquently um channel all those thoughts that i was getting across to him through all those interviews and and, and times that we're able to speak because it's it's really an insane topic i feel like at times when there's so much potential risk uh and it's not being spoken about um my wife has cancer now uh justin i didn't tell you that um i was a little st- a little scared to do this interview. Um, but before I get too emotional, let me just tell everybody listening, don't let anybody tell you your health isn't important. Don't let anybody tell you your future isn't important. And um, fight for it if you have to, because people will make you. And then don't, you know, if it's hard, just, you know, uh, fight for what's important and just you know, don't let anybody tell you not to. James, thank you so much. And I'm so sorry to hear about your wife. Okay, well, we're going to have a, a brief discussion here before um, before hearing from Dr. Durska. Justin, I want to go back to you. And in, in your book, you tell many stories of people like James, whose lives have been turned upside down by this industry. And, and I'm wondering if you can share from your, um, your work on this, what, what are some of the through lines you saw in the stories and, and also maybe what was most surprising to you in your research? Yeah. Thank you for that question, Kristen. I just want to, um, speak first about what you just said, James. Um, and first just want to say, you know, I really, uh, it's not everyone that I've connected with that has, that has, I think, given as much of themselves as James has, and that has given as much thought to their situation. And I think that's part of why you're, you know, you, you really laid it out. And, and I just appreciate that. Um, I, I, I know even being a storyteller, being a journalist can be extractive in its own way. And, um, and and that's a really charged uh, and sacred bond, James. And and I and getting into the question now, and you know, it, it's devastating what what you just said. And and I'm really really sorry to hear that. It is, um, and you know, James said it himself. Uh, why wasn't there a wall initially? It is known, uh, and and I know as part of this group, there's a wonderful document called the Compendium on health harms of fracking, um, unconventional oil and gas development. It it puts together all of the research that shows the harms related to unconventional oil and gas development, uh, be they connected to radioactivity emissions, connected to many other things. We we know that there are a massive amount of harms, and yet, uh, as James laid out, a company can still go in, 
and drill and not um, and not fence off their operations in some way, not create a barrier to separate the public, the community, the resident from those harms. And when we talk about harms here, you know, specifically in many instances, we're talking about emissions. Uh, and I think this is what is also so so devastating. We know that there's a lot more than just methane coming up at these wells. Uh, if you go to the Bakken, like like the passage I read lays out, there there's there's flares. Uh, there are once you follow the research, you learn that there there is um, there's benzene, there's other known human carcinogens that are being released, and there's also radon, which is a radioactive gas. And we have not studied though how that interacts and moves through the environment. Um, and so um, I am building up to answer what you asked, Kristen, which is that it is. Um, unfortunately, I start this book with a dedication. Uh, there are 10 people who, who have um, passed away in the time of me writing this book, um, many of them from cancer and many of them well before their time. Um, and, and I think that's a testament to how long it's taken me to write it, but also that it's it is hard to live in oil and gas country and it does actually take a health poll um and um that is something that p is very real for people in the communities um and i really hope one result of this can be um you know some way to look closer and draw connections because i do think connections are there to be drawn and there's very good research happening on that front um but there does need to be more Thank you, Justin. James, I had a, a question for you, if you're willing. Um, I, uh, I understand that from, from Justin's story um, that he shared that, that you also worked for a time in the industry. And I'm wondering if you would be up, if you'd be willing to share a little bit about that, um, what that experience was like and, and why you decided to speak out about it. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> Forgive me for earlier. Um, yeah, no, I, 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 uh, it was almost exciting at first. It's like, Oh, you know, get, get in and be a part of this here. It's, it's, there's a drilling rig all over. Um, he got on there. Um, probably wasn't the best time to get on. It was cold, but <laughs> when isn't it cold in North Dakota? Um, February, um, got on a drilling rig and that's when I saw a lot of the activities that Justin mentioned, kind of, a really haphazard workforce um and kind of uh unfortunately again being on the reservation there was this racism issue and i, I don't know how else to say it uh you show up at the work site and the guy said uh, oh you a, you a paycheck worker you one of those paycheck workers here you're here to work for a paycheck and leave it's like no i'm here to here to make money here to here to, here to earn a living um but when you sit next to a guy who talks about how um him and his partner just did a speedball the trip before coming back up home it's like it's a little uh it's a big turnoff i don't know i didn't want to be working around people that i couldn't trust and if i didn't think somebody had my best interest or my safety in mind it would really be hard to work around them especially if they didn't think you were like them or if you were um just somebody that they didn't want to uh look out for but it is it's too much risks associated with that industry to uh not trust the people you're around and um it's, it kind of scared me off after i after being there and i heard all i needed to hear at that point yeah, thanks for sharing that yeah well and I, i've heard both of you talk about um, the importance of of people having good information about the health risks both of the of all the harms that you've talked about justin and, and also specifically the radioactive waste produced by the industry and that this is key to both the workers and families being able to make good decisions um, and also to making the deeper changes um, so that communities are safer. So I'll ask you first, Justin, and then the same question to you, James, What what's the most important information that you feel should be widely shared? Yeah, I, I think the real lesson of of the book is that there is um, there's a lot more that comes to the surface at an oil and gas well than just the oil and gas. 
it happens to be drawing from a really interesting and complicated and 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 toxic um, reservoir. Really, there there was a paper early on that called shale um, a junk rock, which I thought was interesting. Um, and and but that's really how how to think of it. It, it does not come cleanly out of the surface. There are really an extraordinarily complex suite of hazards associated with this. And they're spread about communities in a variety of different ways. The one thing about radioactivity, though, is you can track these contaminants in ways that other contaminants are difficult to track. So, um, and, and this is where I think this gives people power. This gives group fighting back power. And I'll just give one quick example that's also in the book. A uh, really great network of organizers in the Ohio River Valley area. And we were able to um, get the boots of a worker. And, uh, and there was sludge on the boots, and the sludge was sent to a formal radiological analysis lab. And we realized that the levels of radium in the sludge that were on these workers' boots and also on their hard hat uh, and headlamp, which they're wearing right above their head, by the way, um, were, were many, many times above limits EPA had for cleanup at Superfund sites. So here, a worker is being covered with sludge that is uh, well beyond you know, limits that the EPA deems safe for land let alone, you know, a human's body or face. And so I, I think that is the takeaway. You know, the uh, the leaders, um, the people that many of us are frustrated with can can um, say there is not a problem and, and kind of discredit this, but we will find it with the science. And, and believe you me, when the workers find out that they are dealing with material that is hazardous, um, you know, they're not just going to swallow that and, and, you know, do it for pride out of the country. They're going to want to know what's happening. And that's what's happening right now. And many workers have been coming out and I think more will. Yeah, thanks for that, Justin. I, one of the things that struck me in in reading through um, your book was also just the just really astonishing lack of protective equipment, lack of training, lack of people just really not being aware of what this material was that they were handling every day, um, that that information is not um, is not shared, and and so it it's it was it's yeah stunning. Um, James, do you do you have thoughts from your perspective on you know what's what's the most important information about um, about these risks that that should be widely known? <clears throat> I think the most important information that somebody can get is is uh any useful information at for I don't know if that makes sense I'm sorry it, the the compendium the port report by the uh New York health professionals I honestly I I think that was the the last one when I was bringing my little baby boy home in 2020 in January I presented that to my tribal then then tribal representative and uh never did get an answer um point being sorry to answer your question um People should just, uh, I think, just take take the effort to try to educate themselves however they can to find information because so much of this information is stifled. Yeah, great. Thank you for that. Okay, thanks so much to you both, and and we'll come back for more discussion after we hear um, from Dr. Larissa Durska about the health harms of these exposures. And again, particularly for workers who, who have this lack of training, lack of protection, and, and sometimes the lack of knowledge of what they're being exposed to. Um, so we'll introduce Larissa now. Dr. Durska was Director of Pediatrics at Holy Name Hospital in Teaneck, New Jersey. She's been a United Nations representative to ECOSOC with the World Federation of Ukrainian Women's Organizations, where her work was focused on children's rights and particularly children's health. Uh, she co-founded Concerned Health Professionals for, UNOR for New York um, and has, has been a part of the production of that uh, resource that's been mentioned, the Compendium of Scientific Medical and Media Findings on the harms of fracking. So this is an incredibly important resource and, and I think that the link to, to uh, find that has been shared in the chat. Um, so Larissa, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and I think you're gonna go ahead and share some slides with us, which um, for those who are on the phone or listening to this uh, after the fact, those slides are available on, on our webpage and you can download them there. Thank you, Kristen. And first, let me just uh, say to James, I'm so sorry 
for the sufferings that, that you've had to go through. Um, and I've been looking at some of the chat and people are asking and making comments, very relevant comments. Um, so people are informed. I can see um, um, Bird Bear um, mentioned the exemptions and we'll be talking about that um, as one of the reasons that we don't know more. But naturally occurring radioactive substances, or as they call them, norms, co-occur with oil and gas inside um, the deep shale layers, and they're brought to the surface with the wet or the gaseous material during fracking. Fracking opens pathways for the migration of radioactive materials, and they're released as radium in wastewater. And there's also airborne particles from the wellhead. And radionuclides can build up in pipes, equipment, and trucks, and all of this creates risks for workers and residents. Last year, Justin reported on an abandoned, highly radioactive oil and gas facility in West Virginia that had become a party spot, together with organizer Jill Hunkler and former Department of Energy scientist Dr. Yuri Gorby. They recorded high Geiger counter readings in the dirt outside the waste processing building. Besides that radioactive dirt, there was a moat of water that surrounded that processing building, and that was radioactive. Also, the mud that coated the floor of another building nearby was radioactive. It was littered with empty beer cans that testified to the site's popularity as a party spot for local teenagers. And there wasn't any fencing or warning of radioactivity to the locals. So what is the science and why should we be concerned? Well, let's start with these basics. The simplest unit of matter is the atom. It's composed of positively charged protons and neutrons and negatively charged electrons. Elements are atoms with a specific number of protons in the nucleus. And isotopes are forms of elements with varying numbers of neutrons. I'm just adding these term terms for you because I'll be using them uh, not to a great extent, but you'll be hearing them. Um, so, uh, why is this? Why is this uh, 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 definition important? Are these definitions important? Um, an element is stable when electrons, protons, and neutrons are in harmony, and it becomes unstable when neutrons are added or deleted. So in the nucleus are the neutrons and protons, and circling around it in that radon um, element down uh, in the right circle um, are the electrons. So depending on what is emitted will determine the resulting radiation. Um, if if gamma uh, sorry if protons and neutrons are emitted then alpha radiation is is uh, result results and if electrons are emitted it's beta uh, radiation that's emitted and the element tries to become more stable by emitting these particles or electromagnetic radiation so radioactivity the definition of that is that there's an unstable atom that's trying to stabilize itself. And that is a proven human carcinogen. Radioactivity causes damage to DNA and it produces free radicals. And those are the, thought to be the cause of most of the cellular damage. Radium-226 belongs to the decay chain of uranium-238. And that's unstable to begin with. Uh, and the series ends in the right-hand uh, uh, corner, PB, is lead, and that's also toxic. So what happens if radiation finds a living cell in its crosshairs? I'm trying to going to try to answer that question for you because that's what causes the damage. Ionizing radiation, which is the alpha, beta, and gamma, radiation damages cells and tissues by making them charged. And that can cause mutations to DNA and impair metabolic processes, which in turn damages cells. A dose of radioactivity can cause abnormalities in white blood cells and weaken the immune system, and it makes victims susceptible to disease. 
Another side effect is abnormal blood clotting and hemorrhaging because of the reduced production of blood platelets. If the exposure is high, it can kill the cell. If the exposure is less, it can cause cellular damage with inflammation and cancer. The higher the exposure, the higher the risk of cell disruption, tissue damage, and cell death. The parts of the body that are most vulnerable to radiation's effects are the bone marrow, eyes, the gonads, and the thyroid gland. Because of the bone marrow's sensitivity to radiation, the most common radiation-induced cancer is leukemia. Other commonly linked cancers are lung, skin, thyroid, breast, and stomach uh, cancers, and multiple myeloma, which is a blood cancer. And of course, stem cells, which are tissues in the fetus and younger children, are more radiosensitive than mature cells. In general, cells that divide frequently or have high metabolic activity are more susceptible to radiation's negative effects. So keeping in mind latency periods following exposure, you or your doctor may see genetic effects from radiation-induced gene mutations and chromosomal breaks, adverse effects on the fetus and young children, especially in growth and development, an increase in the number of neoplasms like leukemia and other cancers, and cataracts. What are the origins of NORM? I'll try to answer that. And where does it accumulate? The elements of concern from the oil and gas industry are radium and its daughter product, radon, which further decays to polonium and lead. The radium comes from shale and is a liquid, uh, in a liquid state as it exits the wellhead while radon is in a gaseous state. As the liquids and gas separate, the radium mostly ends up with the liquid waste and radon will continue to flow with the gas into gathering lines and pipelines. Most of the radon decay products attach to airborne particulates and those land on exposed surfaces. Thin radioactive films can form on the inner surfaces of gas processing equipment like scrubbers, compressors, reflux pumps, control valves, and product lines. And it accumulates in the form of scales, sludge, scrapings, and pigging wastes that those of you who are in the industry are familiar with. Such accumulations are hazardous to workers, communities, and the environment. So what protections are in place in the United States? Neither the EPA nor the Nuclear Regulatory Commission regulate regu radioactivity that comes from oil and gas industries. And that's because norms are exempt under the Resource, Conservation, uh, Resource Compensation and Recovery Act, or RECRA. And that results in them being unlisted in the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act, or CERCLA. Now, these laws were put into effect, environmental laws to protect human health. And instead, there's a 1980 amendment to that Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, and it's known as the Benson and Bevel Exemption, and it declared oil field waste non-hazardous. The uh, largest source of ionizing radiation is, uh, for the average American is from radon in the air, and it's the leading cause of lung cancer in non-smokers. The fracked gas with radon can escape into the environment during venting, or it accumulates in the pipeline, and, and then you have the operations that the workers are exposed to that causes them to be exposed to the byproducts. Levels of radon Inside Pennsylvania homes have risen since the start of the fracking boom in the mid 2000s and buildings in heavily drilled areas have significantly higher radon readings than areas without well pads. Now I'm just list listing a few pieces of evidence that we have in our compendium of uh, some of the studies that have been done and that's um, that demonstrate the, the harms and the risks of radioactive um, materials coming from downhole. 
So what happens to the radon when it enters the environment? The decay products of radon, which are polonium and lead, are solids. So those two uh, from the gas, uh, they, they um, settle and can attach to particles in the air, and then they deposit on land or in water. Now, radon itself has a short half-life of 3.8 days, but the lead and polonium have longer half-lives of 22.6 years and 138 days. Lead causes neurologic and hematologic toxicity and death, and polonium causes cancer and death. Radon enters the body primarily through inhalation, and most of that radon prior to radioactive decay is exhaled, but some of it, um, some of the solid radioactive polonium and lead remains in the lungs, and this is what causes the cancer. The only safe level of radon is zero, although the EPA allows up to four, a level of four in the environment. A little bit about waste, because that is another stream where radium can accumulate, um, because um, we're concerned about um, the radium and other radioactive elements in the waste. A 2018 study of radium-226 in wastewater from North Dakota's Bakken Shale found potential risk to human health from spills into surface water. And potential radioactive exposures are particularly concerning for drivers of brine trucks, as was documented in a 2020 investigative report. In 13 states where it's legal, oil and gas waste is spread on roadways as a de-icer in the winter or as dust control in the summer. Shale plays high in radium and radon, poorly regulated waste, and federal exemptions are a combination bound to result in problems with health, as some of you have already pointed out. So how does this affect the communities? That live the, uh, communities nearby. In 2020, a Harvard study um, documented a 7% increase in airborne radioactivity downwind from fracking sites at levels that raised health risks for the uh, nearby residents. The closer communities were situated to the wells, the higher the radioactivity they were exposed to. A 20, another 2020 paper on a spill of oil and gas waste documented persistence of heavy metals and radium um, for two and a half years downstream uh, uh, of a North Dakota floodplain. And it also documented exposure pathways, something that the public health uh, in, uh, communities have been having some difficulty uh, documenting, but this paper doc did do just that. Measurements of radium and fracking waste in New York and Pennsylvania from another paper. Um, from uh, uh, these areas uh, have the Marcellus Shale beneath it, beneath these states, have been as high as 3,600 times the regulatory limit for drinking water. And some sewage treatment plants in Pennsylvania accepted fracking fluid with more than 2,000 times the radioactivity allowed in drinking water. So recalling the article that first uh, in the first slide, Justin's article, the 18,000 residents of that West Virginia town had no idea that they were living beside a radioactive fracking waste treatment plant. There are two ways in which personnel can be exposed. So now we're talking about the workers again uh, to the radiation that's emitted by norm. That's through irradiation from external sources and contamination from inhaled and ingested sources, like the radon. Confirmed in a um, 2023 study, the scaly mineral buildup that accumulated in inside the fracking equipment that's a significant source of radiation um, is because it co-precipitates with calcium carbonate and barium sulfate, which are present in fracking material. 
Workers are often exposed to drill cuttings and the fracking waste without adequate protection, even though the IAEA, International Atomic Energy Agency, has recommendations about this. The ALARA principle is important for anyone who has potential exposure, and it stands for as low as reasonably achievable. And it's specifically designed to reduce radiation doses and releases of radioactive materials. So to minimize exposure, one should decrease the time of exposure, increase the distance, and get appropriate shielding. So the IAEA and the International Commission of Radiation Protection have recommendations, which I've just mentioned, uh, and um, and uh, re uh, regarding the radioactivity at oil and gas sites, and most countries adhere to these recommendations. The U.S. is a member, but has instead exempted from federal oversight through RECRA, that law that I mentioned, the materials that come from downhole, which are in many cases radioactive. The exemptions from federal regulations mean that um, responsibility is in the uh, lap of the state, the individual states, and that varies widely. So in these photos, you can see um, uh, at these, these are workers in the UK and in Syria, and they're wear wearing personal protective equipment as they do various tasks. For example, decontaminating the interior of a gas facility or remove bulk uh, sludge or measure norm. So the regulatory bodies need to set down conditions for the protection of workers uh, which will also then protect the public and, and the environment. And that doesn't happen in the United States, for, unfortunately. Instead, corners are regularly cut. And at places like the Fairmont Brine facility, with tanks and impoundments and untreated waste being intentionally discharged into the local environment and workers systematically being plastered in waste without adequate protection. This is the these are pictures from the United States. The Kentucky Department of Environmental Protection learned that radi radioactive waste coming from this place, um, the Fairmont Brine Company had been illegally dumped at a landfill in Eastern Kentucky and it was near a school. And of continuing concern, radioactivity is increasing from this facility, which is on a hill above the Monongahela River which is a source of drinking water for communities across northern West Virginia and Pennsylvania, including the city of Pittsburgh. So we'll end with these pictures that Justin provided. Unfortunately, the regulators have ignored the radiation hazards faced by workers in nearby communities, so the public remains largely unaware of the problem. Thank you. Thank you so much, Larissa. You've uh, done a wonderful job explaining a very complex issue. So thank you for that. Um, before we open up to q and A, I I have a few questions for all three of you. Um, and, and also thanks to the participants who've already put your questions in the Q&A and and invite others to add your questions and, and we'll open up for discussion in just a few moments. Uh, first, for Larissa, I, I wanted to go back. I know you've done work specifically on children's health, and you mentioned the dangers of exposures um, to radiation on uh, development of, of children's um, bodies and systems. Can you tell us a little bit more about what's known about the health impacts on children of these exposures and, and also how they can be exposed? So first about the uh, uh, potential impact, um, children, um, um, children's body cells, the bone marrow, the spleen, um, the stem cells um, go through rapid division and they have high metabolic processes as well, children do. And anytime something, um, uh, uh, anything, Anytime something along the lines of uh, DNA damage affects a cell, uh, it will affect cells that are rapidly dividing much more frequently. 
Um, now, why children? Why are children potentially more uh, susceptible to damage? Well, children's activities predispose them to these um, exposures much more readily. So children pick up things from the floor and they put them in their mouths. Um, you know, and I mentioned how radon attaches to particulates, which then falls on the ground. Children's um, 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 body mass is um, uh, such that they're affected much more readily with um, damages with toxins. You know, you can't uh, apply the same dose of a toxin to a, an adult and a child. So, you know, dosages make a big difference between children and adults. And I think um, uh, very importantly is is the fact that their um, DNA is in a in um, the rapidly dividing phase much more so than in adults, and so their expo any kind of exposure will affect them much more quickly. Thank you. It's sobering. Um, Justin, I have a question for you. Um, so one of the things we see often in our work on environmental health is that vulnerable communities that don't have much political power often bear the brunt of the worst kinds of pollution and contamination. So I'm wondering if you can share in your years of researching this particular issue, did you find this pattern holds true for communities impacted by the fracking industry? Um, yeah, um, absolutely. I, the, what, what's happening with unconventional oil and gas development with fracking is it's like a complicated and sloppy chemistry experiment has been laid out across, you know, rather than on the safe space of, of a laboratory counter, um, on like a, a, across a landscape where human beings live and interact. And so there, um, what, what is occurring is, you know, is a, is a, um, a test really. I mean, it's an unpracticed um, way of contaminating people and we're trying to pick up the pieces and figuring out exactly what's happening. Um, but, but we know that there will be harms and contamination because we know what's involved and what's coming out and we have a rough idea and we know people live here. Um, and I just wanted to, I don't know, um, if this is possible, but I at least want to give a, a shout out to a really a special person I see has joined um, the webinar, which is Lisa DeVille. Lisa and her partner, Walter, run an incredible group at Berthold, Fort Berthold, um, called Power, Protect Our Water and Earth Rights. They also are a big part of the book um, that I'll be publishing later this spring. And, um, and Lisa, Walter, and Power are among a number of really important grassroots groups across the country that, again, are, are on these issues, observing them, following them, um, and um, and also enabling research to happen. And so the um, Larissa mentioned this study done with the brine spill at Fort Berthold. There was a, um, I believe that was Avner Vengash's um, group who, who came in. Uh, and we're able to take samples. Um, and, and Lisa and Walter are, are people who have been, you know, have had eyes on that spill from the beginning and we're not getting information. Um, and, and I think it's an important example because once science looks at it, once we can look at it, we find uh, what happens, which is that, the, you know, there's contamination lingering in this environment. So just, you know, there's important steps where grassroots groups can reach out to greater, you know, researchers beyond the community uh, and quite a lot of information can be learned, and that's powerful information. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much, Lisa, for for joining here. Thank you, Justin, and and yeah, add thanks to Lisa and all the folks at Power for the work that you're that you're doing. Um, I have one final question for all three of you before we open up to the um, participant questions. So. Um, and James, we'll start with start with you on this one. So I, I'm curious um, what you think are the most important steps that should be taken right now to address this problem, in addition to shining light on this issue, which, which as you said in your book, Justin, has been really invisible 
on the national stage. Um, what are some what are some things that can be done right now or should be done, and and how could our listeners support those steps? So, James, I'll I'll start with you. What are your thoughts? Um, I'm I'm a little intimidated with Lisa and and and, and Theodore and, and Joletta, These guys in the in the in the chat here, I think they could really answer a lot of these questions better than I could. I'm, uh, <laughs> they they they're 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 just been a lot more hands on in the process. And I, for unfortunately, my experience has just been a little more on the uh, the individual side. Hope we can get Lisa on. I just did our in regards to what we are dealing with here in Fort Berthold. Forgive me. Um, they, it's just, it's, it's again, as a, as an indigenous community, it's, it's a little more complicated. And, uh, I think our obstacles are, um, not necessarily like, uh, I just, excuse me, there, it's, it's, it's a lot, a lot to factor in being a minority community and, and particularly our political processes. And, and, but, um, anyway, if, uh, if Lisa gets a chance to, to chime in, I, 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 I hope to hear from, from all of them. And, uh, but oh, anyway, thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, thank you. No, thanks for that. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have a way to to open up for Lisa to contribute. But I, I do want to lift up that, I mean, we're hearing that one of the answers and one of the things people can do is learn from and support some of the grassroots groups that are organizing around this issue um, and and find information about what they're doing and, and how they can support that. Um, Larissa, how would you answer that question? What's one of the most important things that, that can be done now and how can people support that? Uh, I would um, reverse the exemptions that oil and gas industry have been granted to um, classify everything that comes from downhole as non-hazardous and also for the protection of workers to uh, adhere to the um, IAEA uh, um, uh recommendations on how workers should be protected when they're working with oil and gas materials. Great. Thank you for that. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of astonishing that, you know, the U S has this exemption and other countries are managing to, um, to, to enforce them. Um, these are these protections. So it's clearly possible. Justin, what would you add? Okay. Hey, everyone. I just, I was calling Lisa. I figured this was an interesting way to um, let her speak. So I'm going to put the phone on. Um... Okay, Lisa. So you're on the call now. This is Lisa DeVille of uh, Power. Hey, welcome, Lisa. Hello, everyone. My name is Representative Lisa Finley DeVille. Um, I don't know where to begin, but um, if you want to, we're talking about a little bit of Fort Bertha Power's work. Uh, we found ways to go around to help um, identify our air quality issues we have here in the Bakken oil and gas field. Um, we submitted a, a grant with the Dakota Resource Council, and we now have five air monitors on for Bristol Reservation. We identified the other day when we woke up, there was a cat pee smell in the air. And so when we checked the just air monitors, they showed that there was a lot of particulate matter. And it was higher than the EPA guideline. So, I mean, that those are the, it, it records in real time. So, uh, I mean, I'm trying to educate the people on what um, the air quality is like living here in the Bakken region. So just like I said, our, our tribe wouldn't support us on um, purchasing air monitors. And that's some of the Fort Bristol Power fought to uh, to purchase with their with the money from from them. But they wouldn't do it. So just like I said, we we wrote a grant. Um, Gillette and Theodora um, have played a big part in uh, Fort Bertha of Power from the very beginning. So the awareness that I mean, anywhere from brine spills, from the air, from frat socks, from you name it, all to do with oil and gas production is um, 
what we try to educate people on. And so there have been studies, but those studies have remained silent because our tribe will not allow them to be um, given out. Um, today, we have a lot of the people running on um, economy and no we will not regulate. So, yeah, we're dealing with a lot of that. And I ran for office and I did introduce a couple of bills on air quality study and on the state highways that run through Fort Berthold and the spills that occur on those state highways. They wreck, they spill everything into the ditch. Um, you know, I wanted soil testing. I wanted, you know, how it's affecting the, um, the soil, but also along with that product, that waste product, leaking into our streams because everything goes back to the water. And Lisa, you're, and, you're a representative uh, with, um, when you say you ran for office, you mean with the North Dakota legislature? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I am the North Dakota um, House representative for District 4A, um, mm -hmm. for Bertha Reservation. And which is incredible, Lisa. And that's um, and just one other thing in front of everyone that I've always found inspiring. Uh, and just to show that you do have agency, you do have power, even if you're just a couple people. I mean, you have been able to do so much. And now you're, you know, you've actually up there with these people. But you've also you you brought your family. You know, you you formed a group with your family. I mean, may, to me that was inspiring. Maybe explain to folks because you, you, your kids are now been brought into yes. this fight yeah thank you yes we have um all my, my children uh four of them are majoring in environmental science uh have received their degrees and uh, yeah we, i went to environmental science also um and yeah that's um <laughs> that that's just so inspiring to me and, and shows that you can bring you know you know, you can always um, you can always bring something and grow it and turn it larger. Um, yeah, thank you, Lisa, for joining. Is there anything else you want to say before um, <laughs> I'll finish mine? Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, thank you for letting me speak to you guys. I was unprepared, but yeah. No, it's important. Thank you. It's so important. Thank you. Okay, ciao. Um, Okay, thank you. Making a, an interesting um, uh, electronic age connection. So yeah, uh, um, passing it on. Thank you, Kristen. Yeah, thank you, Justin, and thank you, Lisa, for your your great your great work and courage and and addressing this issue. So we have a bunch of good questions. So I'm going to turn to some of the, we won't be able to get to all of them, but I'm going to turn to some of the questions from, from our audience. Um, so uh, some are general, some are specific. Um, I, this is interesting to me. Um, a question from Barb Sattler, some of the workers in the gas oil extraction industry are unionized. What is their response to learning about these risks that you're talking about. Justin, is that, or Larissa, is that something that you have found in your, in your work or research? Yeah, there's, there's no union for oil field waste workers. And if you even bring up the idea of a union, if you even bring up the word radiation, if you, for example, bring a Geiger counter to work, because maybe you read one of my articles, and now you're concerned. Um, you you could actually be let go. You know that same day. Um, there there is some there there's union work for some jobs at oil refineries, uh, for example. But most of the jobs in the oil field, and especially the ones dealing with with the waste, are are not unionized. And just to go, you know, one step in the other way, and I think James described this really well. The the tone of uh, and, and the attitude of, of workers, um, I found that in the Marcellus Utica area, there is a pattern, um, and this has occurred at several different facilities, and we have several different sources, um, where companies dealing with radioactive oil field waste will intentionally hire workers 
who have just been released from prison, uh, you'd think this would be a nice opportunity to give someone a job who may well need it, but they don't tell them of the hazards. Um, they don't drug test them, which is another issue. Uh, James also mentioned, you know, it, it's really great to have a job if you don't have to worry about, you know, kicking drugs and, um, and, and they don't tell them of the hazards. And this is really criminal. I mean, they're drawing people who are very desperate and in need um, and, and duping them into doing some of the industry's most dangerous work. So there's definitely not a union and it, it's, you know, the antithesis of a union, really. Thanks. Thanks for that. And I, I haven't, there's another question um, that I think would be interesting to hear from, from both maybe Larissa and Justin about, um, about what is the, are there differences between the conventional oil and gas production and the radioactivity of what's brought to the surface from those processes versus fracking? Would one of you want to address that? Um, uh, yes, because the uh, depth uh, to which they, the, the drills to access the Frack, fracking material go much deeper. They go sideways. There's a lot more material in the unconventional gas drilling. Uh, and also there's a lot more waste, like tons, tons more. So, you know, the magnitude of it is already very different. Mm. Um, also the, the shale plays, I mean, conventional, you go into a pocket of, uh, of gas, extract that gas, and then that's it. Whereas with fracking, you actually go into the shale, which is what contains the radioactive materials. Mm. It's a combination of the, the content of the waste and the volume of the waste are both problematic. Justin, anything to add or, or James, anything to add to that? Um, I, I, I will I'll add that, um, yes, but in un, in conventional drilling, we're still bringing incredible amounts of brine to the surface. And we've learned that the radium levels in brine from conventional oil and gas wells can really be just as high as the radium levels in um, some of the um, unconventional oil and gas plays. Um, Fracking, like Larissa said, definitely brings more waste to the surface. And because you're bringing, as, as Larissa mentioned, the black shale drill cuttings, this is a new waste stream that the industry didn't have to deal with before. You used to drill down vertically through a variety of rock layers. Now we're drilling horizontally for a mile or two through black shales, which have a known radioactive signature. That is absolutely new and created a massive new waste stream that the industry is incapable of handling. But the brine has always been an issue. And so I think it's important to know because in some states they'll say, oh, well, we can use the conventional brine on roads because that's fine. It's like, no, 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 that, that still has radium. That's still a problem. Okay. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, somewhat related question. What what do we know about um, what happens to groundwater due to fracking? Larissa, start us off with that. You're on mute. Sorry, I'm, I'm also chatting with people. Um, so groundwater can be affected in many different ways. First of all, you have volume of water that's used, whether you take it from a stream or a lake or, um, you know, whether you drill wells and extract water from those sources, you can deplete your uh, water table. Your, you can uh, affect the groundwater by Vol again, volume because of the amount that you have to use. And then you contaminate it. So you bring it up and, uh, you know, whether it's, uh, uh, it's, it's not just the radioactive materials, it's heavy metals, it's um, BTEX, it's, you know, plus the radioactivity um, that can contaminate the groundwater. Uh, it'll seep, seep down. Uh, We've also found that, um, well, there are articles that describe the amount of damage. There are voluminous articles on, on the damage to water in, in um, our compendium. Right. It's an incredible resource. So I encourage people who are interested in those details to get yourself a copy. And, and the latest uh, version, the latest edition was just released a few months ago, I think. So it's been recently updated. Um, 
So I have, um, I think we have time for, for one more question. This is from uh, um, Gilletta Bird Fair, who's also with Power. Um, and this is for you, Larissa. How can communities obtain a health study to determine the amounts of hazardous chemicals and or radioactive isotopes in their bodies? Our population is majority young. We have increase in population in comparison to the rest of rural North Dakota. In addition, our population already has high health risks of diabetes, blood pressure, cancers, et cetera. And now with this industrial extraction, um, there's also a drug traffic culture. Um, so the question is around um, to health studies in communities and what steps people can take to move that forward. Doing doing tests of um, the blood and tissues, uh, those are very difficult tests to do. First of all, you know, you're, it's very difficult to do it in children because you're taking material from the children. What are you going to test for? The whole gamut of uh, the materials that are potentially po possible. It, that's, that's very difficult. There's not a set of uh, laboratory studies that you can do on an individual um, that has that lives near a gas well. You'd have to know the components of uh, uh, what they were exposed to. You'd have to establish an exposure pathway. Um, and health departments are not very forthcoming as far as helping with that. And I I hear I hear you as far as um, the risks that are already in certain populations. Um, there was a, a study done by uh, somebody named Aaron Wernham maybe 15 years ago. It was a health impact assessment on the um, um, uh, on the native people uh, in Nupiat, I believe, in Alaska. Um, and th the people there were already dealing with diabetes and and uh, blood pressure problems and and alcohol uh, uh, use and and so um, the um, additional potential risks is you know that's how you would have to define it is what additional amounts of risk would be from uh, would you would you be exposed to from either the radioactivity or the or or the uh lack of being able to hunt and fish on your land or the contamination or um the uh volume of um uh diesel exhaust um so these factors would be put on top of their already uh present health conditions so it's it's called a health impact assessment and um, that would be one way to approach it. And we actually, that was actually one of the ways that we were able to ban fracking in New York State was that we called to the attention of the governor and the legislature, the fact that people were going, their health was going to be impacted. You know, the fact that they didn't look at how uh, pregnant women and and children would be affected. Subpopulations that have underlying conditions already that predispose them to health risks. So we called for a health impact assessment. Well, it's very similar to an environmental impact statement, which is a large uh, amount of work. It's it's expensive. They they realized that a health impact assessment would be very difficult. So they streamlined it a little bit and they did a health review, but they came to the same conclusion, which was that fracking was too risky to have uh, uh, to expose the population of New York State to. So the result was a ban on fracking. So it's called a health impact assessment. Great. Great. Thank you for that. Um, so I'm sorry that we're not able to get to all of the questions that folks have dropped in the Q&A. We will share those questions with our speakers. And if folks have, um, uh, if, if they're able, they'll, they'll write up some answers and we'll get that posted on our, on our website. Before we wrap up, I had, um, Justin, I'm going to pass it back to you for a brief final reading. 
Um, bef before I did that, I wanted to see if, if James or Larissa had any final thoughts that you'd wanted to quickly share with us. Just wanted to thank you for the, the organizers um, for, for bringing this topic to our, to everyone's attention, Justin and James, thank you for uh, living it. And um, thank you to everyone who's attended, which means that you're very interested in, in uh, calling this a, to uh, governmental agencies' attention. So, so thank you. Great. Thank you so much. James, any final thoughts? <clears throat> Just uh, thank you to yourself and, uh, and, and Larissa and Justin and uh, Lisa, uh, Gilletta, Power, everybody. Um, and uh, to everybody listening, uh, yes. Um, do your best to educate yourselves and um, yeah, yeah, thank you. Great. Well, thanks so much also to all of you. Um, it's really been an honor to be in conversation with you all today and I appreciate all the work each of you have done um, and also the questions from the participants and, and all that folks are doing to help protect families and communities from these health harms. And, and I want to pass it to Justin for a brief final reading, and then we'll pass it back to Kira to wrap us up. Justin. Yeah, thank you, Kristen. And I, um, I just wanted to say uh, to James and also to, to Jaletta and Lisa at Power, um, I think, um, you know, one I would be happy to be part of, of some sort of discussion at Fort Berthold. Um, I think, I know the industry likes to do these uh, forums and energy forum where they trumpet all the positives. And I think one way to counter that is to, you know, create our own uh, forums and discussions and have them, you know, on the ground there. And, and maybe that's something we could talk about. I know that's happened as Larissa mentioned that happened in New York that happened in other places. And, um, you know, can work on, on bringing something like that there and raising more awareness um, and, and and also helping getting funding for some of these important ways to measure the air, the water, the soil. Um, but yeah, I, I just really appreciate you all joining. Um, and uh, I'm going to, there's been interest in the exemption. That's an important part to be interested in. So what I'm going to read to you is a part of the book that digs deep into the history of this exemption. And, and again, I really, um, the book is a story, it's many stories, but it's really also a tool for power uh, and a tool for action. Um, and what I'm laying out here in this part of the book is that when the EPA was considering the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, this was an act again to determine uh, of all the industrial waste produced in the US, uh, we realized there's a problem. In the late 1970s, rivers are catching fire. And there's too much industrial waste and it's being dumped freely across the land. So we need to organize it and dispose of it in a better way. And to do that, we need to determine what's hazardous and what's not hazardous. Um, and radioactivity is not a, um, a characteristic that the agency used uh, in the end to determine hazardousness, but it was initially one they intended to use, uh, and and the revelations of that are striking because if they had done that, um, you know everything would have been different. The waste would be called hazardous as it should be, um, but that never happened. So I'm just going to lay that out because I think that is is one of many really important uh, pieces of knowledge to give back, and it's come up in the discussion today. On December 18, 1978, EPA finally published their proposed rules for the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act in an official government journal called the Federal Register. Congress directed this action, recognizing disposal of hazardous waste is a crucial environmental and health problem, it states. Virtually every day, the media carries a story. The most famous one was Love Canal, a neighborhood in Niagara Falls, New York, intended to be a dream community, but it was built over a canal that for years the Hooker Chemical Company filled with drums of toxic waste. By 1978, a foul carcinogenic brew had leached into the backyards and basements of 100 homes and a public school. 
Everywhere, the air had a faint choking smell, one government official reported, and children returned from play with burns on their hands and faces. There was also a spree of birth defects, including one girl born deaf and with an extra row of teeth. EPA's new rules were intended to prevent such tragedies. The core of the program would involve tracking waste from cradle to grave and separating it into two different categories, hazardous and non-hazardous. Hazardous waste would have to be specially handled at the place where it was created, tracked and transported differently, and workers handling this waste would have to receive more training, protection, and presumably also pay. Trucks loading hazardous waste would have to be appropriately marked, the routes potentially altered, and the ultimate disposal site for the waste, as well as any facilities that treated or stored it, would have to be carefully regulated and monitored. This was an attempt to separate industrial waste filled with dangerous toxic contaminants from what was essentially just household garbage and standard office and business trash. Still an important question remained, what waste would actually be defined as hazardous? EPA provided two definitions. Hazardous waste could cause or significantly contribute to, quote, an increase in mortality or an increase in serious irreversible or incapacitating reversible illness, or the waste could, quote, pose a substantial, a substantial present or potential hazard to human health or the environment when improperly treated, stored, transported, disposed of, or otherwise managed. To scientifically determine if a random pile of oozing sludge was harmful, specific attributes of the waste were to be measured and a system of thresholds and limits determined. In the proposed rules presented in 1978, EPA listed eight candidate characteristics for determining hazardousness. One, ignitability. Two, corrosive, corrosive, corrosivity. Three, reactivity. Four, toxicity. Five, radioactivity. Six, infectiousness. Seven, phytotoxicity, meaning toxic to plants. And eight, teratogenicity and mutagenicity, implying birth defects and permanent damage to genetic material. While all eight of these characteristics are described in the proposed rules filed on December 18, 1978 in the Federal Register, EPA stated they would only rely on the first four characteristics in actually determining hazardousness because these are the ones with good these were the ones with good testing protocols available. EPA proposed the rules be expanded to include radioactivity and other characteristics but that never happened. I have asked EPA for more details on why radioactivity was never adopted as a characteristic for defining hazardousness and I'm yet to receive a reply. And I'm yet to receive a reply. Had that happened, it would have changed the course of history because of the billions of tons of waste produced by the oil and gas industry, every single year much of it was sufficiently radioactive as to have been considered hazardous. And I'm just gonna go through the levels as EPA had to find them at the time when they, in a, with level clear minds, thought of what, how much radioactivity do you need to consider something, quote, hazardous. The radioactivity threshold above which EPA considered the waste to be hazardous was 50 picocuries per liter for radium-226 and radium-228 combined for liquid waste. Numbers known today show oil filled waste can be vastly more radioactive. Radium in brine of the Marcellus Formation was found by the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection to average 9,330 picocuries per liter and be as high as 28,500 picocuries per liter, 570 times EPA's proposed limits for hazardousness. Radium levels in the Antrim Formation in Michigan can be almost as high. Radium levels in the Bakken the Permian and conventional oil and gas fields across the country can still be dozens of times EPA's proposed radioactivity limit for hazardousness. As for solid waste, EPA defined hazardous as an average radium-226 concentration of five picocuries per gram. Yet EPA's website presently shows radium levels in oil field sludge can average 75 picocuries per gram and in oil field pipe scale can be as high as 400,000 picocuries per gram. Um, so I wanted to end with that because I think it's a way, you know, this is how we will change things. And the book really lays out as much knowledge and information uh, as I can, and especially these old reports from the past. Um, and, and hopefully, you know, this gives people tools on the ground for accountability. Um, thank you all so much for organizing it. It's a wonderful event. I just really appreciate everyone who helped organize uh, and for everyone attending. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Justin. And I encourage you all to order a copy of Justin's book. If you have a chance, I think you can pre-order it. We've been sharing that link, Petroleum 238, Big Oil's Dangerous Secret and the Grassroots Fight to Stop It. It's truly a powerful story um, that needs to be shared and known far and wide. So Kira, I'll hand it back to you. All right. Well, gosh, well, thank you, Justin and James and Larissa. Uh, just thank you for your courage and your tenacity and your work on these issues. It's clear from this discussion that more is needed, but it's incredible how much you have been doing. Just a reminder, if you want to rewatch or re-listen to the conversation, some of you have been asking about the link of the recording. We'll have it produced in about a week. And if you're on the New School or the Che mailing list, or if you follow the New School feeds on SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube, you'll see them when the recordings are posted. Thank you all so much for joining us at the New School at Commonweal and the Collaborative for Health and Environment. And we hope we'll see you again. Bye, everyone. Don't take it, don't, don't, don't. Don't take it, don't, don't, don't. Don't take it, don't, 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 don't. Don't take it, 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 don't, don't, don't. River is a healer. The river is a sage. The river knows no end. The river feels no